Uh, and I thought it was the smartest thing I ever heard about evolution, and I've been in this game since, I don't know, 92 or something like this. So uh, I found it so compelling that I invited him to come back and do it again. And this time we're recording it, and we're going to put it up on the web and you know, keep comments. And uh, uh, Jackie, thank you for coming. And thank you for not showing as many gels as you didn't show last time. Uh, I was also stricken by, by his beginning. He says, I'm so sorry, I'm not going to show you every gel. And that's a very good thing. For a talk <laughs> like this, you're here to get a different perspective and inspiration, an insight generating kind of talk. You don't get that if you see a gel every other slide. So go and read his cell and other very famous uh, papers about this. But uh, today, just enjoy this Thank and you. have your mind blown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again uh, and to talk to you about uh, what I believe is uh, an exciting uh, change in the way we understand evolution. Um, uh, and it's due to uh, the revival of uh, an old thinker uh, in the field of evolution that has preceded Darwin uh, and his writings by um, a few decades, in fact. And it's uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. He was a French uh, naturalist. Uh, and he, he had a, an, a notion of evolution that he conceived by himself. Uh, he, it was later replaced by Darwin's famous notion of evolution, not because Darwin dismissed of Lamarck's ideas, but because he thought that he can offer a simpler scenario to explain evolution. So uh, Lamarck's theory is broad and, uh, and, and it goes beyond the, 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 the scope of this lecture. A lot of parts of it we understand today are probably incorrect, such as his uh, 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 thought that organisms seek to constantly improve their fitness. Of course, we don't seek to improve anything. We're just selected for the way we are adapted to the environment. But to distill the essence of Lamarckian evolution, or at least what we take from it today, centuries after it was proposed, if Lamarck had to explain why do giraffes have long necks, he would probably come up with something like this. Giraffes were born without a, a long neck, but they, during their life, they extend their necks in order to go into the high trees. And while extending their necks, experiencing a phenotypic change in their body, somehow, miraculously, this change is transmitted to the next generation. So a, phen a phenotypic change that you exper experience in your life can somehow be burned into your genetic material in some way or another in a way that can be propagated to, to your offsprings. If Lamarck's theory applied to every aspect of our life, then perhaps if you went to the gym before you, uh, uh, before you make your kids, uh, then they might be born with uh, stronger muscles. And if you listen to music, they might be more musical. And if you do a lot of math, they might be more mathematics oriented, et cetera, et cetera. If you were exposed, for instance, to an antigen, the kids might be immune to the antigen, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. By and large, we do not think that the, our world is Lamarckian. We see that our parents experience experiences that do not necessarily reflect on our uh, 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 phenotype, let alone the genotype. But in the previous years, there has been an accumulation, a surprising accumulation of not only indications, phenomenological indications, that Lamarckian evolution might exist here and then. It still might be the exception and not the rule. Darwinian evolution is the, the normal way in which things works. But in addition to phenomenology that describes interesting cases in which parents' experience may have changed somehow the offspring's uh, genetics. In addition to that, and more profoundly, and this is what brings me to the field, some potential molecular mechanisms have arisen that suggest a way for Lamarckian effects to actually be propagated across generations. And this, I think, is a turning point in our understanding of evolution. This requires further attention of molecular biologists, molecular geneticists such as myself and others in the field. So let me actually uh, start by humbly uh, serving uh, uh, from the literature examples from recent years about molecular mechanisms that could realize some aspects of Lamarckian evolution. 
And then I'll try to show you how we try to bring in these concepts into a laboratory research that we do in my lab, yet without any gel. Uh, so if you will, the essence of the difference between Lamarckian and Darwinian evolution is the following. Darwin suggests that the genotype, although he didn't use that term precisely, that the genotype instructs the phenotype, the environment selects for the most fit phenotype, and that genotype that may have, that, that happened to have instructed the most fit individual, uh, uh, those that are selected by the environment, those whose phenotype is selected for, those genotypes get to be propagated more efficiently to the next generation. That's the essence of Darwinian evolution. If I were to uh, uh, distill the difference between Lamarckian and Darwinian evolution, it would simply be this backward going arrow from the phenotype to the genotype that Darwin excludes and Lamarck actually puts forward explicitly, although again, not in this uh, uh, modern term of genotype and phenotype. A change that is experienced at a given environment at the phenotypic level can somehow be propagated to the next generation either by its going to affect the genotype, so that, for instance, your genes could be changing in response to a diet that you ate, <clears throat> if that were to be explicitly termed in modern terms, which are probably incorrect, or at least that the phenotype has a capacity to be propagated to the next generation such that a change that you have experienced at a given environment in your phenotype, although it might not necessarily change your DNA sequence per se, it might still be propagatable to the next generation because of some way to propagate or to memorize a phenotypic change at least for a while. And what, what, I, what I'm going to suggest towards the end is perhaps that a combination of ways to propagate a phenotype or a phenotypic change and ways to, uh, to burn information into the genotype are kind of uh, preceding one, uh, 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 one another such that a phenotypic change is experienced in an organism, say at the physiological level, it is then propagated for a while at some epigenetic level that carries over a phenotypic change for subsequent generations, and ultimately at some point a burning of that information into the genome could occur, in, in which case already this information is, 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 is propagated to the next generations uh, uh, quite faithfully as much as any other genetic change that, that we experience. So this is the essence of the difference, this backward going arrow, and perhaps in addition I should add a phenotype propagation arrow that allows to propagate a phenotypic change through uh, uh, epigenetic changes that we'll discuss a little bit uh, in, in more details, and this is the essence of the difference. Uh, what was the fate of Lamarckian thinking immediately after he proposed, immediately after Darwin came up with his uh, uh, <coughs> origin of species? It was completely abandoned, not because there was any proof against Lamarckian evolution, but because Darwin simply proposed a more parsimonious scenario. The Lamarckian, uh, uh, the Lamarckian scenario is nothing but parsimonious, is nothing but simple. It requires very sophisticated ways for which we are not aware to propagate a change at the phenotypic level or to even burn it back into the genome. Uh, Darwin's scenario uh, uh, gained that the, the fame simply because it, wa it was much more parsimonious and we like parsimonious explanations to explain nature. It was actually Weissmann, a German scientist, a German doctor, that gave the blow to the Lamarckian, uh, 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 to the Lamarckian idea. <coughs> what he did was for many, many generations, he took mice, he cut their tails, and he was surprised to see that the next generation is nonetheless born with, with the tail. So Weissmann concluded that there is a barrier, a conceptual barrier, that prevents propagation of information from the somatic tissues to the germline, say to the sperm of those and eggs of those mice, and in that way it precludes the, the Lamarckian scenario. But nevertheless, Lamarckian scenario could be relevant in some other cases, for instance in unicellulars, in bacteria, yeast, etc., etc. There's no distinction between a soma and a germline because there's, it's only in one cell. So any change, phenotypic change that is experienced in a, in a unicellular is by definition also present in the cell that would give rise to the next generation, so unicellulars might, ex might escape the Weissman burial. Plants are another interesting example for how you could es escape the, 
barrier between soma to germline because plants germlines are often generated from somatic tissues, meristems, that can then be uh, later on during the life of a mature plant can be reprogrammed to become a, st a sperm cell or an egg cell for the next generation. Cancer is another interesting example where uh, within a, a multicellular sexually reproducing organism, a unicellular type of species, quote unquote, a cancerous mitotically dividing non-sexual cell could propagate, of course, cancer is evolution, I think you all know that. Any change that is experienced in this cancerous cell is by definition, at least in principle, inheritable to the next cellular generation of the cancer, and as such, cancer could be Lamarckian, although the organism that carries it might not be. Another way to evade the Weismann barrier is those events that actually take place within the sperm or the eggs themselves. Of course, any change that you experience during your life in your germ cells is by definition ready to be transmitted to the next generation and it is not subject to the Weismann barrier between the soma and the germline. And by the way, an interesting difference between sperm and, and eggs could be relevant here because as we know, sperms are generated constantly and eggs have a totally different and much more limited capacity to report on the, on the, on the recent past uh, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of a female. And the last point along these lines is that maybe after all, although the Weismann barrier was established based on experiments done in mice with this uh, crazy uh, 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 tail cutting, etc., maybe after all that the, the Weismann barrier, quote unquote, is uh, penetratable and there are, there are ways to, 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 to propagate information from the soma to the germline. But rather than arguing forever whether the world is Lamarckian or Darwinian, I think that what, 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 what might be much more constructive and helpful and insightful is rather to consider this as a dichotomous uh, uh, di uh, distinction between one alternative into another, to consider a totally continuous scale that spans all the range between some scenarios that would arguably be purely Darwinian and others that would be purely Lamarckian. So the purely Darwinian, we said, mutations occur totally at random, irrespective of their effect on the fitness, irrespective of the environment, irrespective of anything. It's a blind process, and those mutations that happen to be useful or increase the fitness of the phenotype at a given environment, those are selected for, and anything else is just due to chance. The purely the Lamarckian case is, as we said, you experience a change and it immediately affects the next generation in a heritable fashion. But in between them, there is a whole spectrum of events, of molecular processes that modern biology is now aware of, uh, that could realize very many different intermediates along this scale. And I want to devote the, ver the next 15 minutes or so to exposing a few of the recent molecular biology developments that put different biological systems on some, on some interesting places along this continuum. And the first minimalist deviation from a purely D L Darwinian scenario is the process of ex uh, that is called expression coupled mutagenesis and also stressed coupled mutagenesis. What is stressed coupled mutagenesis? We all know, or at least molecular biologists know, that when stressed at given environments, organisms would deliberately, in a, in a, in a, in a regulated fashion, increase the mutation rates that they experience in their genome. Okay? So here is a, a kind of a foot in the door, a way to deviate from the purely Darwinian case. The environment does affect the mutation rate and organisms are in fact programmed to realize that they should increase mutation rates when conditions are bad. So this is a deviation in time from a totally random process of mutation. But there is also a deviation in, in space, not only in time. What is a deviation in space? This is called expression coupled mutagenesis or perhaps better, more accurate, transcription coupled mutagenesis. I'm not going into the details, but it is well known that when a, a certain DNA is transcribed more heavily, say at a given condition, for example, a Hitchcock gene under a Hitchcock condition, at the moment you open the double strand of the DNA to read it, it becomes more liable for mutations. So mutations accumulate more rapidly in those regions of the genomes that are read more extensively at a given condition. 
This is a perfect way to bias the mutagenesis process or the mutation accumulation process in time and space so as to extensify the search for good solutions exactly for the genes that are needed under the environment that prevails at the moment. So the combination of stress-induced mutagenesis and transcription, ca transcription capital mutagenesis allow to deviate in time and space from a totally random and uniform process in which mutations occur throughout time and throughout the genome totally blindly into a scenario that could bias the rate of mutation to be higher exactly at the genes that the organism needs to optimize now uh, uh, and not elsewhere in the genome and not for those genes in other times. So this is, I believe, a minimalist and yet very interesting deviation from the purely Darwinian scenario and a humble step towards Lamarckian uh, uh, scenario. On top of those uh, humble moves from uh, Lamarckian, from Darwinian, purely Darwinian uh, scenarios, I want to expose you to the, to the concept of soft inheritance or biological inertia as it appears in the literature. This is a limited perpetuity of a change that is experienced at the phenotypic level that can be inherited as such as a phenotypic change, not yet a genotypic change, as a phenotypic change to the next generation. Perhaps only one generation, perhaps a few more generations, perhaps for many, many generations until, for instance, it has a chance to be assimilated into the genome as a genetic change. Here is one example from a, a, a dear friend and colleague, a, 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 a late MIT professor, Susan Lindquist, who uh, passed away last year. Uh, she inspired me to think uh, a lot in these directions. She gave me the courage to think about Lamarckian evolution in modern genetic terms. I admired her and her science. And this is uh, one of the nicest examples that Susan uh, has uh, 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 discovered that shows a capacity of an organism to perpetuate a phenotypic change only at the phenotypic level, at the so-called epigenetic level, <coughs> way before it could be assimilated into the genome. And I will cut a very, very long story, extremely short, to just tell you that many proteins in the genome assume a unique three-dimensional structure that is instructed for them by their corresponding genes, and as such, they function within a cell. But a deviation from that uh, common scenario is the so-called prion state in which proteins can agglomerate and aggregate and, and change their conformational change. And what's interesting about these prion-forming proteins is that they are autocatalytic. So if the environment contains no prionic version of that protein, then all the proteins are standalone, well-behaved, non-aggregated proteins. But at the moment you have a few aggregates beginning to emerge, those aggregates are autocatalytic. They can recruit additional copies that are initially normally folded for that protein. And you get a whole aggregate that functions differently than the sum of each of the individual standalone versions of that same protein. So a prion is a device that can, that once formed, maybe by chance, maybe you, con you consumed it in your diet, maybe the environment somehow inflicted a change that, 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 that triggered it. Once formed, it has a memory because of the autocatalytic nature of the prion recruitment process. So this is a general principle and as such, prions could serve as an epigenetic agent that acts at the protein level. Most people think about epigenetics as something that happens at the DNA and histones will see that too. But it turns out that epigenetics can apply also to the protein level. Epigenetic, if defined as a, as a non-genetic change that is propagatable across generations, could be, could be uh, inherited uh, in the form of a protein that was modified and, and that has an autocatalytic capacity. So to put within a context, the environment could trigger the change that generates the first prionic version of a protein, and then it could sustain itself. But if an environmental change is relaxed and the environment returns to the state it was before, then uh, the prion state could uh, dissipate at some point. And Susan uh, uh, did wonderful work to demonstrate this idea in many different contexts of many different prions. This is just one of them, a, prot a prion called Psi, a very interesting biology uh, in the non-prionic form, this protein uh, helps the, it's a release factor of the ribosome, it helps it recognize the stop codon. In the prionic state, it evades stop codons. So you get an immediate way 
to violate the basic rules of gene translation, violate the stop codon instructions, continue reading through, through the, through the thri three prime UTR, expose hidden genetic diversity, but apparently cells could do that in a stochastic fashion that is yet, that is yet epigenetically heritable, and what you get is a device that disseminates very, very quickly hidden diversity into the phenotype, and that device itself can be propagated across generations in an epigenetic fashion at least as long as the prion state is alive. So it's a beautiful me mechanism that suggests soft inheritance or biological inertia uh, uh, that although is not going to be burning back in uh, the DNA, it does generate a solution or a change that could be propagated further. Another example comes from uh, uh, the lab of, uh, of Oli Rando from uh, University of Massachusetts at uh, Worcester. This is already a striking study in which they showed, this time in mammals, in mice, that, an, a, that a phenotypic change or a dietary change experienced by mice, fathers, not mothers. It's a bit obvious when a change that is experienced by the mother is affecting the next generation, right, for obvious reasons. But if the father experienced the change and the offsprings show modified metabolism or nutrition, this is already very profound. And indeed, Oli Rando in this cell paper from 2010 has starved male mice for, 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 uh, for protein. <coughs> Bless you. And he made them with normally fed mothers. And he looked at the embryo, and he looked at the offsprings. This is the low protein diet fed, with, uh, crossed with uh, normally fed mothers. And this is as a, as a control, normally fed fathers and mothers. So you compare those two um, uh, offsprings, those whose fathers were starved for proteins, those whose fathers were not starved for proteins. Back then they did that with a microarray. Today uh, this is done uh, by RNA sequencing and epigenome sequencing, etc., etc. Et it's a very long story with many puzzles and many unanswered uh, questions. But the interesting thing is that if you check the liver of the offsprings, the, 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 meta, the, the genes encoding for a variety of metabolic genes within the liver, it changes depending on the father's nutrition. So this is not yet exposing a mechanism. More recently, Oliver Rando showed a, a, a change, a surprising change at the tRNA content of the sperm, tRNA fragments in particular could be changing uh, depending on the father's diet, much more to be revealed in this direction. But nevertheless, the phenomenology and perhaps also a mechanism that could uh, be related to methylation, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and non-coding RNA <coughs> are being deciphered and arguably putting this uh, scenario somewhere in between, uh, between the Lamarckian and the Darwinian case. My friend and colleague from Tel Aviv University, back then already uh, still uh, uh, at, uh, uh, at uh, Columbia University, Oded Rechavi, showed something similar, but uh, 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 in a different context, in, in, in the warm C. elegans. Oded attacked uh, C. elegans, uh, uh, C. elegans with, with a virus, a virus dedicated especially for C. elegans. And to cut a long story short, if you immunize the parents, then their offsprings and their grandchilds and their grand-grandchilds and for a few additional generations, they might be immunized as well for those viruses. It turns out that the immunity mechanism is RNA dependent and it's in fact dependent on a special enzyme that is called RNA dependent RNA polymerase. I know that this audience is not very molecularly oriented so I'll simplify things. RNA dependent RNA polymerase is a polymerase. It makes RNA from RNA without a template of DNA. Okay, so it takes RNA and makes another RNA from it. The RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is a requirement for those cells to be able to propagate this information about the immunity, the experience that they have experienced towards that virus to the next generations, many, many generations, I think at least 10, 10 generations, without the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, the memory only lasts for a few generations, maybe two or three generations. It appears to be a mechanism that propagates an RNAi-based response towards the virus, an immune-type response that sits at the RNA level. It is propagated from one generation to the other, but without ever going into the genome and without being inherited in a Mendelian fashion. 
Okay? So this is another example for a soft inheritance because it's not that the phenotype changes the genotype at that environment, but the phenotype is, the phenotypic change is propagatable at least for a few more generations. Move even further to the right, we get into the famous CRISPR system. CRISPR is very famous these days because of its technological applications. You might hear, I'm sure many of you have heard, that this is a system, this is a set of technologies, in fact, that allow us to, that allow us to edit genomes. <clears throat> For those who don't know, I want to survey very, very quickly what does the, the CRISPR system mean for bacteria and why do we and others claim that this is in fact a bona fide Lamarckian system if Lamarckian system is all about changing your genome in response to a particular environmental exposure in a way that would be uh, affecting the next generation. So in very short terms, what CRISPR is, is a defense mechanism of bacteria, about 40% of bacteria have it, against viruses, against phages that, that infect them. <coughs> and the way it works is that a bacterium that is infected by a virus can take a small piece of DNA from that viral genome and append it to a particular cassette within its own genome. And if the virus has killed the bacterium, too bad, but if the virus, if, but if the bacteria survived uh, this attack, now it has a memory from that experience. It has a short piece of DNA from the viral genome that it puts in its own genome. That piece of DNA can be transcribed into an RNA molecule that upon a subsequent uh, encounter with such a virus can attack the virus, home in an, a, 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 another protein called Cas9 that can target the viral genome based on the homing information that it has from a previous generation, and as such, it could become immune to the virus, and the next generations could become immune to the virus too. So originally, an innate immunity, uh, uh, system, uh, 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 an innate immunity system uh, uh, for, for the bacteria can serve as a way to mitigate uh, 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 subsequent ex encounters of the virus. But from the Lamarckian perspective, this is a, almost a purely perfectly Lamarckian process because a previous change in the environment is embedded into the genome of the host and it's embedded in such a way that is inherited to the next generation. So you could say that it's an acquired immunity on the first generation, but in the next generation, it's already an innate immunity because you are born built in with a defense mechanism, defense solution for a particular bacterial species, a viral species. Moving perhaps even further to the, to the, to the right or equally uh, uh, localized at the right side of the, of the spectrum could be a, a generalization of the CRISPR uh, uh, mechanism and that's the process of horizontal gene transfer. Horizontal gene transfer is much more widespread than CRISPR itself. It exists actually also outside of the bacterial world, in eukaryotes too, maybe even in us, some people think. It's a way to take DNA from foreign donors, from other species, and integrate it into your genome. In what circumstances do organisms integrate foreign DNA into their genomes? There are various ways to do that. They are called conjugation and transduction and transformation. I'll give you just one example. Suppose that you are a bacterium and you swim in the sea and you find uh, 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 next to you pieces of DNA that, res that are results of degradation of others' genomes, other species' genomes, dead cells that were decomposed, their DNA was released to the environment, broken up randomly into smaller pieces of just a few kilobases. You can uptake those pieces of DNA, integrate them into your genome, and just hope for good, okay? Languages also do that when they borrow words from one into another. Technologies also are based on borrowing, stealing, whatever ideas from one another. This is a way to borrow or steal ideas, genetic ideas, from organisms that can be very, very far from yourself. This is one effective way for bacteria to evade the lack of sex. Bacteria don't have sex, and without sex, there is no way to mix different properties from different genomes, horizontal gene transfer is a way to 
to enrich your genome and, and diversify your genetic solutions very, very quickly. And interestingly, this is done in bacteria only upon need, and the need is stress. Bacteria would not open up their chromosome for foreign random pieces of DNA if everything is good for them. One way to convince bacteria that they should take foreign DNA is to stress them, then they start a stress response mechanism, part of which is the activation of the machinery that uptakes foreign DNA and integrates it into the genome. If you will, at the beginning of the talk, this returns us back to a point at the beginning of the talk, stress-induced mutagenesis. We say that there is an active process of increasing mutagenesis upon stress. The horizontal gene transfer could be viewed as such. It's an active mechanism that introduces mutations, which are the equivalent of many, many, sorry, introduces foreign DNA segments, which are the equivalent of many, many mutations sometimes. And it is deliberately governed such that it would be exercised upon times of stress. But what's interesting and profound for our needs is that if Lamarckian evolution is all about changing heritably your genome upon exposure to a particular environment, there's nothing more Lamarckian than horizontal gene transfer because here the environment itself becomes part of your genome. The environment is a foreign piece of DNA from another organism's uh, genome and it becomes part of the genome of the host and as such it could serve as a, as a purely Lamarckian process. It is due to Eugene Kunin from NCBI from the LIH and others that the realization that horizontal gene transfer as much as Lamarckian and others are contributing to our ideas of bona fide Lamarckian evolution processes. <coughs> I want to switch now gears and tell you a little bit about our own research into Lamarckian evolution. We want to bring Lamarckian studies into the lab and actually do experiment with various Lamarckian-like processes that we believe might be active in cells. So the first, uh, the first experiment I want to show you is our experiment into horizontal gene transfer. And the motivation here was not so much to show Lamarckian evolution, et cetera, et cetera. We wanted to contribute to the study of horizontal gene transfer by a lab well-controlled experiment. Let me motivate that experiment. Suppose that I give you now an organism, maybe it, it could be E. coli, maybe a more exotic one, I give you either a file in the computer, the genome of this organism, or I just give you the bug itself in a test tube. And I give you a simple task. Come back and tell me which genes were acquired horizontally by this species in its past. How do you do that? Not only that I want to know which genes, if any, it may have acquired horizontally, I want you to tell me who was the donor, uh, why? This, why these, these, these genes, did these genes <laughs> a key, a, a, a integrate into the genome of this host? What was the challenge, the environmental challenge that those genes were meant to solve? What is the interplay between solving a problem by yourself and copying from somebody else? If you were given a very tough exam, you might want to first write it yourself and only later on consult with somebody else. Do bacteria do the same or do they just grab something instead of attempting to develop their own mutation in-house solutions to the problem? What happens to the gene after it's being integrated into the genome? How does it accumulate and assimilate into the genome, get the right accent, etc., etc.? This is a set of outstanding questions that are not easily answerable if I just gave you a file of that genome or, or the bug in a test tube. How to do that? So there are ways, bioinformatics has been dealing with a horizontal gene transfer for a few decades and there are algorithms and ways to detect horizontally transferred genes into the genome. Those algorithms, like any other algorithm in bioinformatics, they have their, their false negatives and false positives. We don't identify everything, and not everything that we identify as horizontally transferred is a genuine result of HET, HET, horizontal gene transfer, lateral gene transfer too, LGT, lateral, yeah. And even if you identify bioinformatically correctly a, a transmitted gene horizontally, it is very hard to tell what is the source, when was it acquired, what was the environmental condition that justified it, 
uh, uh, what is the rate of assimilation, what's the interplay between mutations, in-house mutations, as opposed to uh, inspiration from other organisms' DNA, et cetera, et cetera. So we realized that the bioinformatic approach is limited in its capacity to deliver, and we decided to do in-house, in the lab, a horizontal gene transfer experiment. In this experiment, we take, we take uh, Bacillus subtilis cells, these are cells that are very happy to take foreign DNA from their environment, and we stress them. We stress them with a high salt condition. And we let them evolve without any foreign DNA, but this is just a control to see how, how well can they do if they just build on their own mutations. But we also suggest to them foreign DNA from several genetic libraries that we have constructed. For example, we take DNA from the Dead Sea that has a very high salt concentration or from the Mediterranean that has a much lower uh, uh, salt concentration or from other sources. Now, the advantage here is that we sequence the genome before and after and we sequence the libraries that we provide to the, to the cells. We know exactly what was the pressure and we can sequence at many time points along the process so we can fully capture the dynamics. We can answer questions such as, would the cell copy from a cell that is extremely highly salt tolerant but is very far away phylogenetically from it? Or would they rather copy from somebody who is closer phylogenetically, although it is much, le much less salt tolerant than the other, say, Dead Sea uh, archaeon that we are uh, uh, giving DNA with? I don't have time to go through all of it, but I just want to show you how beautiful the experiment uh, uh, and the results are. This is generations. It runs to 500 generations in which the bacteria were evolving towards the challenge at the presence of various sources of DNA, uh, uh, DNAs. This is uh, the emergence of various mutants that arise in the population. We discover them by sequencing, deep sequencing, all the populations and isolated clones from it. <clears throat> and we, in particular, identify many horizontally gene transferred events. We can detect the transfer events. We actually decipher that most of the transfer events occur from the closest relatives to those cells, so they cannot take foreign DNA from a faraway bacterium, even if that bacterium has a fantastic salt tolerance. So we can discern horizontally transferred segments, and we can discern point mutations that arise in their own bacterial genome during the process. And what's interesting, and it repeats itself in many, many repeats of the experiments that we did, is that first to emerge is these dotted, dotted lines that represent point mutations. So surprisingly for us, way before the organism resorts to foreign DNA, it actually looks for its own mutations. Later on, the horizontal gene transfer events, and many of them tend to occur in, in clusters, in bursts, begin to take over such that towards the end of the experiment, you have an accumulation of horizontally transferred solutions that are gradually replacing the in-house solutions that the bacteria discovered for, from their own genome. So this is one interesting way to expose a Lamarckian scenario in the lab in an experiment. Another is our, uh, uh, um, I think, unique uh, idea that one way to reverse the flow of information from the phenotype into the genotype is by a process called reverse transcription. Reverse transcription is a well-known process uh, RNA viruses, for instance, use that in order to integrate their genome, uh, their RNA-based genome, into the host genome. Many repetitive elements, retro elements in our own genome, odor propagation into the, within the genome, say, ALU elements that exist in a million copies in, in the genome of each of us, owe their replication capacity to a process of reverse transcription that takes RNA and makes DNA out of it. And with my friend, Elad Schneidman, we realized that this is an interesting opportunity for a Lamarckian process. Because if Lamarckian differs from Darwinian evolution by the reversal of information from the phenotype to the genotype, reverse transcription can do exactly that. This is an example of reverse transcription in language. What is through? You don't write through this way, right? You don't express the G and the H. And since they are omitted in the expression, Reverse transcribing it, namely writing the way you express it, amounts to evolving through a process of reverse transcription. So that 
soon enough, and in fact, I think it already exists, dictionaries would start to, which are the DNA of the language, as opposed to the pronounced language, the expressed language, which is the RNA of the language, the language itself or the dictionary of the language would start to reflect that. And there are many interesting examples of a word that is pronounced differently from the way it's written, and then it becomes to be uh, uh, written the way it is pronounced and going through this cycle, you invent new words, sometimes you diversify their meanings, etc., etc. So it exists in, in, in language. There's also a, a neural analog for that, long-term and short-term memory. I don't have time to go into it. What do we do about that? What, what do we do about that? It turns out that this retro element exists also in yeast uh, cells that we li like very much to work with. And in fact, there is little factories within the yeast cells called viral-like particles because they're like viruses. Inside of these particles, reverse transcription reactions are known to occur to propagate that virus-like particle for its own sake. But it turns out that other genes from the genome, from the host, can get a ride on this process. They can be encapsulated into this viral-like particle and undergo a process of through, becoming through and then written back into the dictionary in the modified form. This is interesting because if you look at RNA at a given environment, it contains a lot of information that the DNA doesn't have. To begin with, RNA can vary vastly in copy number, whereas the DNA copy number is roughly the same. For example, if your cell experiences an attack at a, 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 from, say, from a heat shock, then the heat shock response RNAs would increase by much, and the DNA would not reflect that information. So the, D the RNA contains a very interesting information about copies at a given environment. If you burn it back into the genome, you put back into the genome an information about the event that occurred at the moment in the environment. RNA is produced at a very high error weight, allowing a very, very efficient exploration of sequence space exactly for the genes that are transcribed at a given moment. RNA undergoes many base modifications depending on the environment. It undergoes splicing, <coughs> polyadenylation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are many, many differences between the RNA and the DNA. And if you burn back the information from the RNA into the DNA, and this is a way to do that, then you can actually reveal to the next generation something about what happened in your generation. So in the lab, we have been able to, to isolate those particles, and we are now sequencing their RNA and DNA content to exactly see which genes get arrived on the genome and in collaboration with Jeff, with Jeff Buka from, uh, uh, from New York, uh, we are discerning genes that are getting an efficient ride onto the viral-like particle. Those genes are likely to be transmitted to the next generation in a modified way, a way that could serve to reflect to the next generation a change that occurred to them in the previous one. I want to now continue, show to you what do we do in the lab when we uh, 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 experimentally follow organisms along their evolutionary tracks and how we establish a paradigm that allows us to ask questions about other cognitive-like abilities of microorganisms, of microbes, to cope with their environment, perhaps by memorizing a change, perhaps also by predicting a change before it actually occurs. So this is a work that was done in my lab by a former uh, 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 PhD student, Amir Mitchell. He's now a professor at the University of Massachusetts in Worcester, the same place where Oli Rando is. And Amir, when he came to my lab, he said, if I look at a bacterial species that enters into the digestive tracts on the way to become part of the microbiome that is now very famous, it undergoes or it experiences very interesting changes in the ecologies that it's exposed to. First of all, it's typically cooler outside and the moment it gets into the body, it is experiencing a temperature elevation. Said Tavazoi has also realized that in the context of establishing a very similar cognitive-like system for bacterial species. <clears throat> so it gets into the body and it experiences a change the temperature change. It also experiences a change in the partial pressure of oxygen. When it gets into the stomach, the pH drops. 
and in various locations along the tract, it sees different carbon sources that are serving for its diet. So the idea was, and then it is being deposited in the stool on the ground, and then a whole different set of conditions, such as, for example, UV radiation might, uh, uh, might be inflicted upon it. So uh, we realized that as E. coli goes into the D GI tract and then secreted and then being eaten again, and it cycles between body soil, body soil, body soil, it may have an opportunity not only to respond to a change when it occurs, but in fact to perhaps try to predict the next change and start to prepare for it before it actually comes. So for example, along the way, if somewhere here, there is one carbon source that is serving E. coli, and that happens to be lactose, and down the tract, it will have to switch to another carbon source, which happens to be another sugar, maltose, then perhaps the lactose is serving as a Pavlovian bell that conditions the cell to understand, quote unquote, that in a few hours, they are likely to switch to a new type of meal, a maltose-based meal, and maybe like a Pavlovian conditioned organism that sees one, one, triggering, one trigger and predicts the next one and start to prepare for it, right? Because the Pavlovian dog salivates already in response to the bell. It doesn't wait to see the meat in order to start salivation. And this is a classical paradigm in cognitive sciences, classical conditioning. Maybe organisms as simple as E. coli and yeast cells can also classically condition on their environment. So we have done that and we've published it in a couple of papers a few years ago. Amit, Amir, was the, Amir Mitchell was the, was the hero of this project. In the interest of time, I don't think I'll go into great many details. I'll just tell you this. I, I, I'll, I'll skip over a few slides here. We did an experiment. We gave E. coli maltose, but before giving it maltose, we gave it lactose to mimic the order of events in the microbiome. It turns out that if you proceed the maltose course with a tiny amount of lactose, just a ring of a bell, two things happen. First of all, it would activate ahead of time the genes that would be needed later on for maltose. And when it gets to the maltose deal, meal, it can utilize it more effectively than if it didn't get that prior alarm. So E. coli has a built-in Pavlovian-like capacity to see one condition and predict the next one, start to prepare to it ahead of time, and indeed survive it better or utilize the opportunity better when it actually comes in. So that was exciting. We, we, we established that in analogy to classical conditioning, there is something that we called microbial conditioning. It's an evolutionary process. It's not a cognitive process that happens during your life, but over evolution. And nevertheless, it's the closest analog to a Pavlovian scenario. To make it even closely, more closely related to a Pavlovian scenario, we follow the Pavlovian teaching or the procedure one step, one additional step. After Pavlov has established a conditioned response in its dog between the bell and the meat, he wanted to see if he can make an extinction of that response. How do you extinct it? You ring the bell and don't give it meat. So bell no meat, bell no meat. The, the dog learns that the rules of the game have changed and he stops salivating in response to the bell. Only when the meat comes does it salivate. So we decided to do just the same in an in-lab evolution experiment. We evolved the E. coli to hear the bell and never get the meat. Namely, we gave it lactose, but never gave it maltose. So lactose, no maltose, lactose, no maltose. What happens? At some point, we got strains that extinguished the connection between lactose and maltose. They can still respond to maltose when mal maltose comes, but they are not doing the cross-reference between the lactose and the maltose. That has proven to us that the investment in the future is something that E. coli chooses to do in conditions that justify this investment. And if the conditions do not justify this investment because lactose is not followed by maltose, then it can change it and it can cut the expense. It no longer activates the maltose genes in response to lactose because it doesn't pay off to do that. In fact, we've even developed a precise mathematical model that 
for various parameters in the environment, such as how reproducible and predictable, et cetera, is the environment, and what are the costs for prior uh, accumulation of the prior preparation, the, this trait of Pavlovian conditioning would be selected for or against. I will skip the details, but they are really nice, and you're welcome to look into this paper. <coughs> We then switch to, uh, to, to, uh, 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 to yeast, our second most favorite uh, uh, lab organism, to see how evolution in the lab takes place in response to the simplest of physical triggers that you can give an organism, a change in the temperature or a change in pH. Okay? So we take our ancestor yeast cells and we evolve them towards high temperatures. 39 degrees. And as always in lab evolution experiments, we do the same experiment in many repeats, just to see if the same solution is discovered by the cells again and again, or maybe the landscape of solutions is so complicated that each time you do the experiment, you'd get something totally different. And as a control, we evolve the cells towards exactly the same conditions, same test tube, same media, et cetera, et cetera, but the condition in terms of temperature is very mild. So there's no stress here. So four repeats with the low, no, normal temperature and four repeats with the high temperature. This is all done by a former student, Aviu Yona, who is now a postdoc here uh, with uh, Jeff Gore and Eric Alm at MIT. What happens to these cells that doesn't, never happens to these cells? It turns out that they always duplicate one chromosome immediately. In a few hundred generations, they duplicate a chromosome. Before doing any point mutation, they just take chromosome three and make another copy of it. If you remember in the horizontal gene transfer experiment, we actually saw that the point mutations accumulate before a massive piece of DNA is, been, is being acquired. Here it was the reverse. No point mutations, just a very rapid accumulation or a, a gain of another copy of a chromosome. This is a very fast process. The probability to do that due to missegregation of homologous chromosomes in mitosis is very high compared to a point mutation. And the first thing that they do, this is a complicated way to see that. This is the copy number of all the genes along the genome. This is chromosome number three. And chromosome number three gains in copy, one additional copy, each time we do the experiment under Hitchcock. I'll later t show you or tell you that when we challenge them with another condition, uh, um, a, a high pH, they don't duplicate chromosome three, but they always duplicate chromosome five. Beginning of a notion is that in different conditions, different stresses may have accumulation of genes that are relevant to them on particular chromosomes, and then you simply duplicate that chromosome as a quick and dirty solution that is readily available because of missegregation of homologous chromosomes. So that was nice, but then we took one of those cells and we returned them back into the normal temperature to see how memorable is this solution when you take them away from the challenge. And what happens is that they always lose the chromosome, return back to two chromosome normal karyotype, and with that, they, lose the, the, they forget the lesson they are no longer heat resistant. <clears throat> so the copy of a chromosome is a very good solution in, in short terms. It will gain you very quickly adaptation to the stress, but it has several, many interesting shortcomings. A, it's not memorable. Put them in a vacation from the stress, they will lose the chromosome because they don't need it, it's just a burden. And with the loss of the chromosome, they forget the lesson because there are no point mutations that base that solution into the genome. So with the loss of the chromosome is the loss of the lesson. Another, I'm not showing you that, but it's in that PNAS paper, those cells that underwent the chromosome duplication become very bad in essentially any other condition. So it's a very tailored solution to the pressure that you have. Put them at high pH and they would be very miserable because they have the wrong chromosome duplicated. In fact, if we take those cells and let them evolve even further under the same condition, they miraculously replace the chromosome duplication-based solution by point mutation-based solution, suggesting that the chromosome duplication was only an interme evolutionary intermediate, a stepping stone as we call it. A quick and dirty solution, you start from it, 
it buys you time to then look for the right point mutations. And once the right point mutations are found, the extra copy of the chromosome can be thrown away. And now you have a solution that if you now relax it, you now, you now take it into a vacation, it will sustain because the fitness is no longer compromised by a burden of another copy of a chromosome. The fitness of those guys is very good both at high temperature and at normal temperature because it is not based on a chromosome duplication but rather on a few point mutations that provide the right solution. But those point mutations, they take a lot of time to be discovered. So the initial solution is just based on the gross quick and dirty chromosome duplication that gives you the time and then you look for the right mutations and put them in place. So this is how we envisage the, 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 the two-phase solution. And that, with the Lamarckian story that I've been telling you a lot about, all of these culminated in a, a, a theory or a concept that a view Yona and myself have developed and just published recently a few years ago, a couple of years ago in, in, as, a, as a concept paper uh, in Cell about a relay race on the evolutionary adaptation spectrum. What is the relay race and what is the adaptation spectrum? So imagine that an organism experiences a change at a particular environment. For instance, it might be now cold for you in this room. So what might happen to you physiologically when you're cold? For example, we have hairs on our body and they would start to, how do you call it? Yeah. To what? What is it? Pyloerection. Pyloerection. Okay. So they will erect, and that would provide an insulation, a thermal insulation that would protect you from the cold. But obviously, your offsprings will not inherit an erected hairs in their body. This is a very short uh, uh, challenge and a short term physiological uh, solution. And once the challenge is gone, you would relax it back and you would forget about it. But what if the cold temperature persisted now for months and years and a thousand years? Maybe in the next uh, millennium, people will be born already with erected errors because this is the, the, uh, because this is the right solution for the, environmental, the new environmental condition. So in between a physiological change and a hardwired, genetically encoded, burned into the genome solution, there is a spectrum of changes that can occur that could reflect various degrees of commitment towards the change and that they take longer to be assimilated. But there is a relay race between them in the sense that what we discovered based on analysis of extensive literature is that oftentimes changes that occur early on in the process would set in motion changes that occur later on along the evolutionary spectrum. So the first change is a physiological one, such as the erection of the air in your body, or it could be, for instance, a transcription on your skin, or it could be a transcription or translation change in gene expression, et cetera, et cetera. It could be a metabolic change. It could be a small molecule-based change, all sorts of changes that are very rapidly emerging in response to a challenge. And immediately as it's gone, they are relaxed back to the normal condition. The next stage could be envisaged as all sorts of epigenetic changes that can occur to an organism. And an epigenetic level is already interesting because it entails some ability to propagate the change, presumably across generations, at least across cellular generations, if not across even organismal generations. We saw before the Susan Lindquist uh, case of the prions in yeast that are epigenetic changes occur at the level of proteins we saw the Oded Rechavi epigenetic change in propagating an RNA-based response, the RNAi response to viruses in C. elegans. And at the DNA, I think you know, there are very famous epigenetic changes at the chromatin level, CPG methylation, I'll talk about them in a minute, that allow a physiological change to be propagated for longer than just a few minutes or hours that typically characterize a physiological change. Next come genome structure changes. I've just shown you one, the gain of another chromosome. And only later would come a genetic change that actually hardwire an information into a modified sequence and perhaps 
what's more stable even than a genetic change is a genetic change with some redundancy. Say you have two genes that redundantly or semi-redundantly or apparently redundantly carry out a related function. So this is a whole spectrum and what's interesting is that many of these early stages in the spectrum can facilitate the emergence of later ones and hence is the relay race dynamics that we are proposing. To give one example, I've already given you one example that connects between a physiological change all the way to a genetic change. <clears throat> we talked at the beginning about transcription coupled mutagenesis. Transcription is of course a physiological response but we said that once occurring in a particular gene, if, a, if the reading level of a particular gene, the extent to which you read it, is extensified at a particular condition, namely transcription rate has increased, then the writing rate of this gene is also increased because it gets more mutation. So if physiologically you change the expression level of a gene, that could change the genetics of that gene. Many physiological changes are impinging upon the epigenetic change epigenetic level and I have to rush, I'm over time, so I won't have time to go into this. This is all in this paper, but you might know for instance a cytosine methylation uh, constitutes such an opportunity for organism to change an epigenetic mark on the DNA in response to a transcription activity, but those epigenetic changes in turn can be propagated backwards into the transcription level and this way you can actually solidify a short-term transcriptional solution, it is now partially hard-coded into the DNA and what's interesting is that as opposed to a transcriptional change, an epigenetic change such as in a CPG methylation can be propagated to the next generations. And not only that, it has a capacity to also affect a, a rate of mutation in the region manifesting several different uh, uh, stations along this relay race on the adaptation spectrum. So towards the very end, I want to tell you about a challenge that uh, 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 Andreas here and others have participated in. It's a challenge that we announced a, a year ago. It's called Evolthon. And it is meant to uh, recruit the participation of the entire community in our attempt to understand how best can we evolve organisms towards uh, various uh, physiological and other tasks that we can envisage. And the way we challenged the community was that we announced that prior to a conference on genome evolution that we held at the Weizmann Institute, a few months before that, whoever wanted to participate could get from us either an E. coli or a yeast cell that is genomically barcoded uniquely for each lab. And the task is to evolve them towards low temperature in this time. We had enough with high temperature. So evolving towards low temperature, 10, 10 degrees and 15 degrees for, uh, for uh, cerevisia and for E. coli respectively. So how do you do that? If I gave you now an E. coli and I would ask you to return it in two months when it is uh, adapted to, to a, low, a low temperature environment, how would you do that? So many people participated here at the MIT. There was a very interesting uh, 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 strategy to do that. Perhaps you can hear about it more from you. Uh, 30 labs from around the world participated. This is the challenge. Uh, we got uh, indeed participation from, from, from many. Some people experienced with mutagenesis solutions, other with environmental solutions such as the regime of exposure to the low temperature. Other used population genetics principles such as bottlenecking the population. Other used directed engineering that was allowed to in this experiment. Some others used the capacity of yeast cells to mate sexually with one another and to recombine existing solutions that they might have in genomes. Others used non-directed uh, engineering and some metabolic challenges, et cetera, et cetera. The mutagenesis was either done by uh, uh, mutagens, chemicals, or by strains that have high mutation rate throughout their genome. It's a very, very interesting endeavor. We are in the process, we, we will soon announce results. <laughs> in the process of, of experimenting uh, and sequencing and competing all the strains in various conditions, it seems, by the way, that sex prevails, sex wins. Whoever did mating d get, got to the best solutions. Uh, but I want to uh, uh, 
rather than disclosing results that are still in the processing, I want to, f to end with, uh, with um, triggering you with why this is interesting and what interesting questions could be asked about these competitions. So imagine that somebody did mutagenesis, applied a very high mutation rate on their genome, and they got a good strain. It can sustain a, high a low temperature. Presumably, you could guess that this very harsh solution could, uh, could and, and this is not based on any result, I'm just guessing here, could, could have delivered a good solution towards the low temperature, but it may have compromised many additional functionalities. And it may have uh, 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 provided a solution that is as non-stable as the whole chromosome gross uh, gain uh, 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 solution that is a very gross one because it comes with a huge burden, such that if you take the cells away for a vacation, as we did in the East case, and then return them, you would see that they forgot the lesson. So we ask, which solutions are doing the best on the target, sol on the target uh, uh, challenge? We have results for that, and this is where sex appears to have uh, contributed the best solutions. But we also want to understand what type of trade-offs did each solution uh, uh, make or impose. For example, a trade-off would be that although you grow well on the low temperature, you don't grow very well on the high temperature, so that if I now return you back to the high temperature, you would not do as well as before. So a trade-off in learning is an interesting property, and the question is going to be, what type of strategies subject the organism to a more severe trade-off and which ones are not entailing any, any, any harsh trade-off? Another question that you can ask, and this is where analogy to, to learning in a cognitive context becomes very uh, appealing. If you were to have a particular strategy to learn for an exam, say in physics, how good would you do in an exam in chemistry later on? You didn't prepare for a chemistry. But have you learned in a way that would make you also better in another thing that you were not trained to do? Or would you, so you, in, in which case you would be called a generalist? Or maybe you have been so specifically tuned yourself towards the challenge that you cannot solve any other challenge now. Maybe it even limits your ability to learn a new challenge in a new evolutionary experiment that we are doing. And if you were a student that memorized everything for the exam, you come the next morning, you do the exam very well, but your strategy for learning was such that if I now give you a summer break and I re-examine you, it turns out that you remember nothing from this exam. You saw what happened to the chromosome gain example. After a few generations away from the pressure, they lost the memory, they lost every knowledge about how to compete, how to cope with that environment. I didn't show you, but when we evolved the cells gradually towards the high temperature and not abruptly, they never copied the chromosome. And if you give them a vacation and then examine them, they remember perfectly the story because they have a different solution, a different evolutionary solution. So we have been able to take away all the 30 competitors for a vacation for a few hundred generations, and then we have examined them back on the original condition that they were selected for. And we're waiting to, to, for the results to show us which strategies acquire the organism with an ability to memorize the lesson after a vacation and which not. So four different criteria. Hopefully we'll have a winner in each of them and then everyone is happy. So one criterion is how well do you do on the exam that was designated? Another is how well do you do for the original condition? How well do you do for other exams? And how well do you do for that exam after a vacation? Uh, this will hopefully uh, 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 could be linked in interesting ways to the various strategies that people used for adaptation, for, for evolution. So we are hoping to very soon release the results and then together as a community to write a paper about it with, with conclusions. <clears throat> so um, I think with that I should end and just end, uh, acknowledge the people who did that, so Ona Dahan is my research associate and she was deeply involved in essentially everything that I've shown you. A view, Yona did the chromosome duplication experiment, discovered, uh, he discovered uh, uh, 
uh, the quick adaptation uh, through uh, aneuploidy and its refinement and all that story. And he is also the first author on this relay race on ad the adaptation spectrum. <coughs> Amir Mitchell, I told you about him. He did the conditioning experiment, the Pavlovian uh, bacteria. He's now a professor at UMass. Uh, Itamal did the uh, uh, horizontal gene transfer together with Shai uh, experiments uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Bacillus subtilis and Sivan is doing Evelthon, and she's doing, uh, she's doing the reverse transcription uh, viral-like particle experiments. And these are our collaborator, and thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Jackie, for coming here. I don't know what's of all the things that we heard today, uh, you know, what's your sort of uh, moment of clarity if you had one, but uh, I think I'm going to open it up for questions if you Please, would. please. Uh, <coughs> this time my favorite part was where I think you said that phenotype and behavior are the same thing, which is very nice yes. to me. It sounds great. So some questions please for our uh, speaker. And by the way, do you want to tell them about the Vulcan next year? Perhaps some of the people want to... Uh, uh, we are still the, um, Stay tuned. <laughs> Uh, we are still contemplating uh, how to do a Volton of next year, what would be the challenge, uh, etc. cetera. Um, I, there's nothing to announce yet, um, but we want to do, we want to first finish this one, write the paper, get response from the community, and then plan together with others what should be the next One challenge. One of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my career was with, with Shannon and others who went to play this competition and we learned the most amount you could learn in five weeks. Uh, that was amazing. It, 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 that it, it, was it, great. You know, we had a lot of good times. Um, that was fantastic. Great question. Yes, the question. Uh, the question was an excellent one. <laughs> uh, um, the question was as follows: When you expose your yeast cells to one condition, to a heat shock, they gain chromosome three. When you expose them to a high pH, they, chromosome, they gain chromosome five. What would happen if you were to expose them to the two conditions together? You could raise the temperature and raise the pH and see what happens. And perhaps you even generalize it further, uh, as you nicely said, what if you expose them to various different conditions that could require the duplication of many, many chromosomes? And I began to say that it's a great question. We thought about it uh, uh, very abruptly, but not as clearly as you are suggesting here. And unfortunately, we haven't done this experiment. So I think it's a, it's a must-do experiment, and uh, maybe we or you or anyone else, maybe you, would actually like to do that. It's the simplest of, of all experiments. You simply take yeast cells, you put them in a high-temperature incubator, give them a high pH. To detect which chromosome have been duplicated, it's a bit more challenging, uh, but, but nothing serious. Um, uh, we did that back then with microarrays, both RNA and DNA arrays. Uh, today I would do that with DNA and RNA sequencing. I think it's a great question, and I don't even have a guess what would happen. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This is a more general question, but do you think that all genes are equally susceptible to this epigenetic changes that then can be if all genes are equally susceptible to these epigenetic changes, and then you can think that even more permanent changes in the DNA in further generations. Say, if you look at genes involved in stress responses and neurological responses or structural genes, so I think they're equally. Okay, very very good. So the question is, are all genes uh, equally susceptible to? epigenetic changes and perhaps to a propagation of the epigenetic change to the next level such as uh, mutation uh, level. Um, I, and, and you suggest in particular the stress genes as opposed to... Uh, as opposed, for instance, to structural genes. 
could be subject to 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 evolvability uh, due to due to um, uh, epigenetics to various various degrees. I think it's a great question, and I think the answer is that not all genes are equally susceptible. And your your intuition is, I think, I think it resonates with uh, facts from the literature. For example, we know that stress genes, as opposed to structural genes, indeed. <coughs> exhibit uh, much lower variability, phenotypic variability across within a population. It's studies that we have done and others have done that show that stress genes are very, very noisy. Now, Mabar Kai from uh, the Weizmann Institute has shown that stress-related genes have a promoter architecture that differs from the promoter architecture of structural genes in its ability to engage the nucleosome uh, that, that structure that the DNA is wrapped around and, uh, and, and, and forms typically a nucleosome-free region uh, upstream to the promoter, but not equally for all genes. And the difference in nucleosome affinity for the promoters of stress genes as opposed to structural genes renders them different in terms of their noise property, namely non-genetic diversity in the population with respect to their expression level, but also in their sensitivity to mutations, the rate at which they accumulate mutations, and the rate at which they accumulate an epigenetic change. So it appears as if stress genes are deliberately more fastly evolvable, and they can propagate changes that occur perhaps from the uh, uh, physiological to the epigenetic to the genetic level due to a built-in difference that is hard-coded by itself in the sequence of the promoter, built-in sequence in their promoter architectures. On top of that, I told you that, um, that uh, we do this uh, horizontal gene transfer experiment, and a very interesting possibility is that different genes are acquired with different efficiencies into genomes. That is another way to see that. We see, for instance, that in our heat, uh, uh, salt tolerance experiment, we see particular genes that are being accumulated into the genome. That could be a result of selection, but there might be interesting differences too. The CRISPR cassette is, an, is a very good example of genes that are very easily uh, uh, attained, acquired and retained in evolution and hence contribute to the, to the fitness. Um, I believe that expression level of genes would dictate a, long, a lot of the processes along the line such that, for instance, highly expressed genes would have a built-in capacity to evolve more rapidly because the DNA has to be open more for expressing them. And as we said, at the moment the DNA is open, it's also open not only for reading but for writing. So it gets mutations more, more readily. So there, there might be many good reasons for your intuition for why stress genes and other genes might be more evolvable uh, than structural genes, etc. Question which, uh, I've been, um, a little asked, louder, please. Probably. I have a question which I've been asking myself um, as I work in a lab as well. So if it's so easy to transform uh, foreign DNA into microorganisms such as bacteria and fungi, um, environmental or microbiome uh, bacteria or fungi are faced uh, with a foreign DNA from decaying organisms all the time in the environment. What is the barrier if there is one that they don't acquire, let's say, genes from a human or genes from uh, a decaying animal? So the question is, if, uh, if, if, if the, what is or if there is a barrier for horizontal gene transfer for, uh, um, that, that prevents microorganisms from constantly acquiring and integrating into their genomes foreign DNA from their environment, for instance, an example that was given is bacteria in the human microbiome could have, should have, maybe would have, maybe they do have DNA from the foreign, from the host, from the human host. And um, it's, an, again, another very good question. Um, and if you're asking about the barrier for that, indeed it seems that, phenomenologically, indeed it seems that there are barriers of different heights, if you will, for horizontal uh, acquisition of DNA from different organisms because the very basic system that, that allows 
uh, the acquisition of foreign DNA from the environment is present or absent to various extents in different organisms. Uh, and they are willing to do that to different levels. For example, Bacillus subtilis we worked with here because it has a built-in mechanism. By the way, this mechanism consists of 100 genes. The competent system, it's, it's, a, it's a collection of 100 genes that together uh, uh, govern the whole process of acquisition of foreign DNA, importing the DNA into the cell, uh, integrating it in the, into the genome, regulating and orchestrating the entire process is a very complicated process. You have to gain 100 genes in order to be able to do that. And not all organisms have that capacity. Uh, in addition, you have to acknowledge that getting a random piece of DNA and putting it into your genome doesn't sound like the safest thing that you could do to your genome. Would you be willing to take a random piece of DNA from tomato and put it in your own genome? I wouldn't, for instance. So it's a huge risk that organisms take upon themselves. And in fact, there is a trade-off between two alternative risks. One is the risk of running out of solutions. The other is to put within your genome a piece of DNA that might be totally harm harmful. And indeed, defense mechanisms of the type of CRISPR, for instance, and other defense mechanisms, such as uh, restriction enzymes and others, have evolved, in fact, to attack and to, to, and to prevent such foreign pieces of DNA from entering into the cell, let alone entering into the genome. So I think that organisms are facing an interesting dilemma or a trade-off between defense and, uh, if you will, novelty. Uh, or it's, it's a, I'm sorry? Adaptation. Adaptation, yes. In, in the cognitive context, they are talking about the, the, the trade-off between exploration and exploitation, right? When you explore, you cannot exploit. When you exploit, you cannot explore as efficiently. So there might be very good reasons to limit your exploration and not go too wild, such as to put a totally foreign piece of DNA totally at random into your genome. Having said that, organisms uh, do, do that and uh, do, do incorporate foreign DNA from their environment, but they do that for various extents. By the way, naked DNA, uptake of naked DNA in the form of the competent system is only one way to get foreign DNA. Viruses are another very effective agent that package DNA from one cell and they could uh, download that uh, DNA in another organism and many organisms are of course subject to viral infections and to uh, contamination of their genome with, uh, with DNA. So, and, and I don't know, by the way, it's interesting, I don't know to what extent do we know if the microbiome in any organism tends to carry pieces of DNA from the host. It's in, the, the flip side is do we have DNA from our microbial uh, microbes? And there, are, there were claims that we do, and uh, those claims have diminished, maybe also almost to the point that they have uh, eliminated altogether. But exchange of DNA is possible in principle between hosts and microbiomes. Jack, there is a new thing, perhaps, not only so new for you or others in the field, but uh, at least new to me that demo sponges, <laughs> supposedly 400 million <coughs> organisms that live in the very uh, depths of the Mariana trenches and things like this, have human. Synapse genes in their DNA. I heard that. Yes. yes. This is amazing. Horizontal gene transfer. Yes. This is amazing. Yes. Uh, so, two questions. One is scientific, one political. A uh, scientific question following All the gene transfers, horizontal gene transfers, CRISPRs, RNA, SIRNA, SI RNA, and so on. So, you mentioned it's all consensus. I'm sorry, you click acid. acid. It's all known genetic material for many years. You mentioned briefly Susan Lincoln's work. It's SAP 35. That's totally cut by protein, aggregation, and genetic transfer. But only stay for one generation and stay several generations. That's right. How common is that? How common is that? That, of course, is totally against dogma. It is against dogma, and this is why it's so exciting. And so the question is, uh, beyond nucleic acid exchange, DNA and maybe RNA, 
uh, across organisms, across different species, how common it is for proteins to be acquired from one organism to the other. Um, so for exactly, so I was just going to say, uh, so for prions, the med cow disease is a very good example for that. Uh, the creutzfeldt jakob disease is related to that, Kuru, et cetera, et cetera. How was it first discovered by Prusiner, who got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the prions? In uh, 1957, and okay. he won the Nobel Prize in 1976. So Prusiner was a medical doctor, Chun Li, and Gajicic brought Prusiner to the beginning okay. in the 1970s. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. But the guy that got the person who won the Nobel Prize in 1997, 21 years after that uh, Okay, I appreciate that. But in any case, this is a good demonstration exactly for what you are saying, because the Kuru disease can be transmitted and was discovered due to a transmission event that happens by cannibalistic uh, 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 tribes that used to eat the brains of dead human bodies and be infected by the prion form of that protein. We all have that protein. It's not sub-35, it's, it's another protein. We all have it, but in the non-prion form. But at the moment you eat it, this is an environmental change in your diet that triggers the switch from the non-prionic to the prionic form. And once triggered, this change is in, in, in the inheritable. It leads to uh, damage to, uh, to neuronal cells in these particular diseases. Um, but I'm sure it happens in many other tissues in the body, just the neurons, because they do not divide, are the most uh, sensitive uh, cells to this type of assault. Uh, in addition to that, studies uh, uh, such as those that are done in Sigal Ben Yehuda's lab at the Hebrew University and others are showing that bacterial cells that can be of different species can be connected to each other by nanotubes that they form, that connect between them. And those nanotubes can be served to transfer RNA, uh, small molecules, and proteins too. So this is a way to communicate, uh, I, I call it molecular gossip. They can gossip and tell, the, tell each other what they have been exposed to just recently. It's not a transfer of the DNA, but just, you know, I've seen this, you've seen that, let's exchange information. In a political one. Political gossip, yes. Yeah, you know, I grew up in China. And just spent five years in Russia. And, uh, Soviet Union. Huh? The Soviet Union was called the by Soviet them. Union. Yeah. Many communist countries were not really active teaching Darwinism. Right. They were teaching Lamarck Lamar. or Lysenko. Lysenko, of course. And so, as a consequence, and as, uh, Darwinism was not taught. But we all believe, because communists try to model the people's mind and so on, brainwash. brainwash. So then emphasize over the uh, Lamarck and of course. the Senko. Of course. But would that, but that doesn't work. After Sukhoi found apart and then China changed, it kind of disappeared. Yes. But yes. with the ideal, the uh, parents and the children and so on, just like a family image, then uh, give you idea that goes on, it's not Mongolian and it's not Lamarck either. What kind of is it, this kind of thing? Yeah. That's why, that's why I asked a political question. It is a political question and uh, it relates, um, for those who don't know, to a very dark chapter in the history of, uh, I wouldn't say the history of science, it's the history of politics imposing uh, um, or trying to dictate science in the former uh, Soviet Union, uh, a, how should I call him, a, a bureaucrat, a pseudo-scientist, Lyshenko, he was a good friend of, I think, of Stalin, and he tried to implement within the Soviet Union a genetics community and agricultural community, uh, he imposed uh, research that would justify Lamarckian evolution. And in doing so, he has been able to totally ruin uh, Russian and Soviet Union genetics research for decades. 
There was no, there was no genetics in, in, in the former Soviet, Soviet Union, despite having fantastic science in other fields, in math and physics, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, because it fit the ideology of the Communist Party that Lamarckian evolution would indeed uh, prevail. And one of the reasons for why Lamarckian evolution was abundant is because of the bad service that uh, Lyshenko uh, uh, gave it. Uh, but nevertheless, if you put science beyond politics and before everything, the indications are that there could be mechanisms that could support that. But I should say very, very humbly, and don't get me wrong, uh, I, the reason why I think that Lamarckian, the Lamarckian revolution is interesting is not because it is very widespread. It's not because it invalidates Darwinian evolution. It's not because uh, a change that you would acquire now would, uh, would affect your future offsprings in most cases. I believe that in most cases it would not. The reason why it's interesting is that even if it occurs in 1% or one promile of the cases, it is still revolutionary and we ought to understand that not because of its extent, but because of how interesting and profound of a change it is. In going through this talk, uh, we have validated, uh, uh, sorry, invalidated uh, or alluded to a much bigger hole in the, in the, or a much more profound deviation from the Darwinian theory, and that's the notion of horizontal gene transfer. In the tree of life of Darwin, the tree of life has a topology of a tree, and all organisms uh, inherit DNA only to their offspring. So inheritance only goes vertically from parents to their offsprings, etc., within a species. And at the moment you realize that horizontal gene transfer is there that can connect maybe even from a microbial host and the host DNA, you see that the tree of life notion is totally incorrect and that there is a network of life, as Eugene Kunin nicely calls it, and not a tree of life, and the network shortcuts in terms of DNA transfer between organisms that can be as far away as we and the bacteria in our body. So this is, I think, a more profound modification of Darwinian evolution, very, very widespread, perhaps more than Lamarckism, although horizontal gene transfer is a Lamarckian process by itself. Yes. <laughs> uh, do you know any way that transposons can kind of fit into this more Lamarckian narrative of evolution? Yes. Uh, transposon, uh, so the question is whether transposons can fit into this Lamarckian scenario, uh, especially when it comes to retro transposons. I think that very much. Uh, because retrotransposons and either encode themselves uh, or utilize others' retrotransposons, reverse transcription machineries. And as I said before, I believe reverse transcription is very interesting because it can give a ride, a hitchhike, not only to the transposons or retrotransposons' own RNA, but also to RNAs, other RNAs in the cell. So they might serve, we are testing that, they might serve as an interesting vehicle that could propagate, um, that could propagate a Lamarckian chain. But this is just a speculation at the moment. Okay, thank you. Very much. Thank you.